Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Manfred Olson Planetarium at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us for tonight's presentation, Dodging Doom, where we will explore the history of asteroids and meteors and our future plans for preventing any major impacts on Earth. Um, before we begin, I'd like to point your attention to the chat box, which is where you can put questions if you think of them during the program. Uh, we'll have a presentation for about 20 or 30 minutes, followed by Q&A at the end. And I'll also point out a few of our upcoming programs. Um, we have shooting stars and meteor showers next month, just in time for the Perseid meteor showers. And um, in, in September, we have our first in-person event in over a year, which is Stars and S'mores. Um, and that will consist of free stargazing and s'mores in the courtyard outside of the physics building. So with that, I will give the floor to the planetarium director and astronomer, Jean Creighton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria, and thanks to you everyone for being here. Um, summer, as you know, is the time for blockbuster movies of epic adventures where the good guys triumph. We have a blockbuster for you. A spacecraft called DART is going to um, slam in to a moon of an asteroid to see if we can change how that system of asteroids are moving. And that will give us information in future, if we need it, uh, how to redirect a potential hazard for the Earth. Um, as you can imagine, something like this sounds like science, fic science fiction. I'm sure that Hollywood could really run with that. Um, scientists can too. And it's my pleasure to talk to you about how we're understanding, how we would address a situation like this and how much we're learning about asteroids and comets and uh, all that that uh, entails. We have a rocky past after all. I'm gonna talk about that rocky past and see what interactions we've had with space debris and we have the scars to show. Um, we're gonna look at how to determine whether something is potentially noteworthy or not. And when we know of a particular object, how would we act? What could we do to protect the earth? So we're gonna start then with this history, this rocky history that I mentioned. And I would like to say that you all have seen impactors of the earth. Um, this is definitely a Hollywood style picture where the intruder is way, way too big. Typically the things that produce shooting stars or those quick uh, streaks of light that we see sometimes at nighttime are about the size of your nail, right? Something like this is ridiculously too big. It would seem to be almost the size of the earth. I can tell you with certainty that the largest asteroid in the solar system is about the size of Texas, and that would be the asteroid Ceres. Now, you don't need to be that big to be a problem. Something like the size of Mount Everest uh, would make a crater that would include Milwaukee, Chicago, and Madison, not to mention Green Bay. Speaking of football fields, a football field uh, would pretty much flatten Milwaukee. Something like a house size object entering the atmosphere would have the power of an atomic bomb. And something like a car is what entered the atmosphere in February of 2013 over the city of Chelyabinsk in Siberia and caused quite a bit of damage. Some of you might have seen the spectacular fireball. That's what we call meteors that are particularly bright. This one was so bright that it was broad, you could see it in broad daylight. I should point out before I show you the video that no person was killed during this um, encounter. Uh, people were injured. There was certainly property damage, but, but um, uh, nobody died. This is, uh, from, I assume, a, a car camera. You'll notice how the light changes. This was, as I said, a particularly bright shooting star. 
and wait for the sound. There's going to be a shot. This object didn't even hit the ground. It exploded in the atmosphere. These fireballs happen all over the world. These are the ones that have been recorded by U.S. sensors for the last 30 years or so. The one that we just saw was, was powerful and damaging, the red one uh, that is the most, by far the most powerful one shown here. But you can see, you know, they're all over the earth. And in most cases, the vast majority of cases, they don't cause any damage. They're actually kind of spectacular. A friend of mine, in fact, told me today that she lived in rural Maine and, and she saw a fireball that really amazed her. This is one relatively close to us in Illinois in 2003, and the fireball is caught by a security camera. And it's because it's so bright and, of course, it's, there's movement as well. So how do we get those? Where, do these, uh, where does this debris come from? And really what we're looking at is, is the origin ultimately is two objects. One is a comet. So comets are made of rocky, icy material with organic compounds. Uh, these objects tend to be at the edges of the solar system uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune. And the actual body, if you will, of the comet is about 10 kilometers. So that would be from the art museum in Milwaukee to the zoo. Now, comets travel toward the sun, and as they approach the sun, a lot of their material evaporates and make these beautiful tails, which have captured the imagination of people uh, since antiquity all over the world. And in many places, um, a, a comet was not necessarily a good omen, but in some cases, it was. Asteroids are sturdier. And that's why you're going to see me talk more about asteroids, because they're um, sturdy enough to survive coming through the atmosphere of the Earth. These are made of rocks and metals. They typically reside between Mars and Jupiter. There are many, many asteroids between there. But as, we, as, we, as we'll find out, there are asteroids that can be closer to the sun than Mars. Asteroids can vary in size between a house to the size of Texas. Now, both of those objects, regardless of whether it's a comet or an asteroid, leave debris behind as they move through space. And because sometimes we don't want to be worried about did it come from a comet or an asteroid, because frankly, often we just can't tell, we have a catch-all term if that debris is small enough we call them meteoroids. And I like that word because it sounds like void of space. So if something is kind of floating around in space, we call it a meteoroid, if it's something like between a marble and a hula hoop in size. Those, by the way, meteoroids are things that are probably most likely causing the uh, shooting stars that you would see on a clear night, any night, any place on the planet, uh, you'd see about five an hour. So a meteoroid hits the top of the atmosphere. These typically are moving about 45,000 miles an hour. Uh, they experience friction when they hit the atmosphere and they make the air around them glow. And we see those cool shooting stars or meteors. Um, this is a picture of one shooting star. If you're lucky, and it is uh, a time where uh, we're having a meteor shower, you might have many uh, meteors simultaneously. By the way, that is a picture of the Perseid uh, shower that we'll talk more if you're interested in this kind of topic. We'll talk more about it in uh, early August. Now, if the meteor is sturdy enough, then at the end of its travel through its atmosphere, it might in fact hit the ground. So I like to say to remember that meteorite is something you might pick up. And I will share with you my meteorite. If we in fact were in person, I would even allow you to touch this if we weren't um, in a COVID situation. Um, this is a gift I was left by the previous 
uh, director of the planetarium, John Harmon. And um, so this is special to, to me. What I can't really um, have you feel is how heavy this is. This is mostly metal. And a lot of meteorites, the ones that are easy to find, they are metallic, therefore they're magnetic and they're easy to kind of uh, spot. All right. Now you might remember that uh, just a little less than a year ago, there was an object uh, about the size of a car, QG 2020, that caught us by surprise. After the fact, we realized that it had come within 18,000, excuse me, 1800 miles from the ground. And in fact, that's close enough that the earth changed its trajectory hereafter. Um, happily for us, an object that is as big as Apophis, which is you know the size of uh, the Eiffel Tower, um, will not get that close. Apophis has been something I've been following now for I think about 15 years. We've known about this asteroid and it is one of these what we call near Earth asteroids. So it, um, it potentially, potentially is close enough that in the distant future, it might in fact uh, intersect with the Earth. I say that in the future, because now we have so many years of data that we can really zoom in to what its orbit is. And we know for a fact that for the next hundred years, this object is not going to hit the Earth, for sure. I'll point out that its closest is going to be on April 13th of 2029, and it will be 20,000 miles from the surface of the Earth, which certainly sounds far enough, and it is. Um, but to put some perspective here, there are satellites, geosynchronous satellites, that are traveling at 22,300 miles. And if you wanted to know what would Apophis make of the Earth? What would Apophis see? This is the view that Apophis would have of the Earth. Now we mentioned fireballs. I'd like now to show you what the evidence we have of impacts on the Earth. And we're gonna look through a long period of time. And I'm pointing out that the time frames that we're looking at get shorter. And eventually it's only gonna be a million years, less than a million years, which means that we're not gonna be seeing big, the chances that we would see something big are not high. Also, I'm gonna show you here um, events. That's not the size of the crater. It's just an indication the size of the circle is just telling us how powerful was the event. Before a billion years, when fish were on the planet, uh, trees, plants, the dinosaurs came and went in this period, and mammals. And less than a million years, we've had people on, on uh, Earth, and this is the kind of events that we've had in the last million years. So we know it's just a matter of time, right? There are things that hit the earth relatively recent, relatively regularly. Shuxalub is a famous site because this is what we think is responsible for taking out the dinosaurs. Um, this was a large object, so about the size of Mount Everest. The crater that it created was reasonably small. This would have been uh, near the Yucatan Peninsula today. And um, we'll see the zone. This is the orange area is where, until where the trees, any trees would have been flattened. The yellow area shows us where there would have been hurricane force winds. And to me, what was most surprising is that some of the debris from that uh, impact reached all the way from Cancun to um, my family in Alberta. So that tells you the force. And we think that one of the reasons why this was so powerful was because it came at a fairly uh, shallow angle. 
I would like to point out um, this movie shows us what we think we would see if we lived on Earth at that time. we are not dinosaurs. We can do something about uh, potential danger, right? So the trick is to first of all identify what might be a problem. I mentioned already Neo, so that's a near-Earth object. I also said that we're mostly concerned about asteroids just because comets tend to be, not always, but they tend to be much more brittle than asteroids. So if you slam them through the atmosphere, most of the material of the comet is going to disintegrate. We have two, among many, dedicated telescopes that are studying objects in the sky, like asteroids. PanSTARRS is at the University of Hawaii, and Catalina Sky Survey is run by the University of Arizona. What we're seeing here is an asteroid that seems to be moving with respect to background stars. So you take pictures multiple nights in a row and you notice what is cruising through. Catalina Sky Survey has discovered in 2020 alone 15 new near-Earth objects. Not all of these, of course, are big or certainly propose a, th a threat, but if for my money, I would prefer to know everything that's out there rather than be surprised. We do have telescopes also in space. NEOWISE is one of them that's looking for near-Earth objects. And um, the name might sound familiar because it did discover a comet that was a naked eye object. Many people were looking for it last summer. Um, this is a picture that Nate Chardin the designer for this program um, took of the comet last year. Now, the fact that you found an asteroid doesn't mean that it's not known. It's new to you, but it could be that the Minor Planet Center already is aware of it. What you would do is you would send your data and they would uh, look, oh yeah, we got that one. Yeah, we know. Or, oh, this is a new one. And then they send that information to CNEOS, which is a center to determine the orbit of the object that was found and also the probability of it hitting the Earth at some point in the future. We have been, thanks to this effort, in the last 40 years, we have made great strides in understanding better how many of these asteroids there are. I'm just saying, and I was frankly amazed to see that in 1981, we knew of 60 of these only, 60. As time has gone by and CNEOS was established, this number has increased. So we have a much better understanding now of what's really uh, available in the solar system. More than 26,000 objects. That sounds like a big number, right? Let's talk a little bit more about the nuances here. Near Earth, uh, this is a, a graphic that shows us near Earth asteroids that we knew as of 2018. And uh, they're swarming here between uh, the Earth and Mars. But of course, those are the light blue ones. The yellow, even larger number are the asteroids that are the typical ones, the ones that are uh, between Mars and Jupiter. Also, I should point out that when we talk about near Earth objects, we're talking about things that are within the orbit of Mars at their closest to the sun. 
So it could be that asteroids are hanging out far for most of their orbit, but when they approach the sun at their closest, that's when they're considered near Earth objects. Of those 26,000 that we've discovered, um, about a quarter of them are the size of a car, about a third of them is the size of a football field. And I'm happy to say that only 3% are the size of what takes out dinosaurs. Those, of course, are ones that we would want to monitor carefully. Having said that, I think it's also useful to say that although we're interested in studying near-Earth asteroids and objects in general, um, we do take into account how close to the Earth they get. So that would be um, a few percent of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And they have to be um, at least 140 meters across. Of those, there are 2,000. So 2,000 potentially hazardous objects. And of the big ones, the ones that we would worry about in terms of if we were dinosaurs, there are 157. These are the kinds of numbers that we can work with, right? So, so far, what have we talked about? We've talked about um, finding all these objects that we can, and we're doing a great job. We're getting much better quality data to find even relatively small objects in our vicinity. We assess the potential uh, concern that these objects might have, and there is planning. Now, um, I thought it was interesting that nations now for planning come together and play a little bit of a kind of a Dungeons and Dragons, kind of a simulated situation, simulated scenario, where you get information about the potential threat and you start considering what you might do depending on different scenarios so that we're better prepared should such a script take place for real. If you've assessed the danger and have a plan, you need to know what your options are. And that's what we'll talk about next. How do we dodge doom? How do we defend Earth? What are our um, possibilities? There is, by the way, a Planetary Defense Coordination Office uh, that's run uh, from NASA. So here we are. We're going to talk about what are the possible ways of um, protecting the Earth. The first thing we need to know is we need to understand the nature of the bodies that are potentially hazardous, right? So in the last uh, more than 20 years now, we have started sending missions to asteroids. NEAR uh, was the first one that orbited and landed on an asteroid called Eros. Hayabusa was um, an effort from the Japanese Space Agency. It visited at Atokawa, uh, another asteroid, and we found to our surprise, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, that the two parts of the asteroid were very different in density as if they're, well, obviously they're made, either they're made of different materials or the structure of the material is different. Possibly these were two independent things that got smushed together. Very interesting. Deep impact visited, this is the only one of these four or five objects that visited a comet called Temple One. It slammed into the comet to see what material is under the surface. And again, we want to understand the composition of these objects because that gives us a better idea of what might move them. Hayabusa 2 is a successor, obviously, of Hayabusa 1. Uh, this mission involved going to the asteroid, picking up material, and it was brought back to Earth in December of 2020, and it's being studied as we speak. And OSIRIS-REx. While observing Bennu, we made some unexpected discoveries. OSIRIS-REx spotted pieces of rocky ejecta bursting off Bennu and into space. The spacecraft was able to observe the entire life cycle of a natural satellite ejecting off an object, entering into orbit, and returning back to the surface. At 6.08 p.m. Eastern on October 20th, 2020, OSIRIS-REx successfully tagged Sample Site Nightingale, 
within one meter of its targeted location. The onboard cameras captured incredible footage of the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism, TagSAM, contacting the surface. And on October 29th, 2020, they stowed the sample for return to Earth. I think it's wonderful that that, that um, package is going to come to Earth in 2024 when the, all the planetariums in the world are going to be 100 years old. And of course, we're going to be celebrating that in a big way. So stay tuned. Here is our dodging doom scenario. This is the project that DART is part of, what I mentioned earlier on. AIDA is an international collaboration to figure out, can you deflect, can you move, change an asteroid? Because frankly, if you have the Earth and an asteroid and we're on a collision course, it's a whole lot easier to change the asteroid's orbit rather than the Earth's. So that's what we're going to try. As part of this mission, DART it stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And we say double asteroid because the system that we're going to see is, in fact, uh, a slightly bigger asteroid with its what we now call moonlet, right? It's an asteroid, but it's a littler asteroid that's going around it. This was, by the way, uh, scheduled to launch in July of this year. So um, that's why the program was now. This has been pushed back a little bit until November for 2021 uh, for its launch, and it's supposed to impact the asteroid in September of 2022. This is the system. Um, these kind of words get me in trouble because they're Greek and I want to say them with the Greek accent, but then you won't recognize the word when you hear it on the radio or the television, so, or the internet. So uh, diademos di is probably what people would say Vivimos is what we would say in Greek, and that means twin. Uh, dimorphos is what people probably would say in English. Um, in Greek, it's vimorphos, which means two-formed. Um, the idea here is that we're going to, so let's say vimorphos has that orbit around vimorphos. Um, we're going to send DART to nudge Vimorphos, so that its orbit gets a little tighter. And what we're trying to do is, can we do this, right? Is this, is this something we can do? And what effect does it have on the system, both on Vimorphos and Vivimos, if we do this? Um, now, there are other ways you could deflect an asteroid that we might try in future, like using gravity as a tractor. So having some object that kind of pulls the asteroid uh, into a slightly different orbit. By the way, I should say that depending on how far ahead you know of a problem, uh, the smaller the tweak you need to make, because you can make a small little tweak and over a period of, say, 30 years, an orbit of an asteroid could uh, change enough to miss the Earth by thousands of miles. We sometimes feel that you probably could change the weight without gassing, either by hitting it with lasers or by shining a mirror and having light fall on to the asteroid and have some of its material evaporate, or to paint it even, so that would change its absorption and, and reflection properties. Something less subtle would be to shove it with some rockets, right? Just, just move it with some sheer force. Um, that would require a fairly small object, right? And um, the kind of nuclear option, I guess, that um, certainly Hollywood favors is it requires to have a, um, these, these movies required uh, nuclear reactions that blew up the asteroid. Um, but a more likely script is that we would uh, have a nuclear explosion nearby and just change its orbit. Having said that, that would be only a solution that we would consider if we really didn't have a whole lot of time and there weren't a lot of options. So here is a fantastic sequence of this adventure that DART is going to embark in. So it's going to leave in November of 2021. It operates with 
solar panels mostly. DART is uh, heading toward Vimorphos. And just a few days before it impacts, it's going to deploy some satellites. You can imagine them as drones that will help uh, videotape, if you will, all that's going on. Um, it's going to slam into the Morphos. And some of that material, of course, is going to be studied, not only by those little uh, probes, but also by a whole other spacecraft that is going to be sent in 2024 by the European Space Agency. And um, they're also going to have drones that will be able to get close to the crater that DART created and uh, make some daring, because drones are a little more disposable to see if there's any uh, detailed measurements they can take close from the ground. It turns out that you can be part of this adventure. You can help be a defender of the Earth. The invitation is to observe the night sky. Um, the, there are um, citizen science projects. This is one, unistellaroptics.com, that engages people who would like to look at night skies and look specifically for objects that move with respect to background stars. Uh, we are not necessarily, so our planetarium observatory isn't necessarily connected to this project, but I just want to show you what um, two students managed to do, managed to see. This is a known asteroid called Industria. Notice how it's moving with respect to background stars from night to night. So that was cool. If you are not able to observe, either because you don't have the equipment or you really aren't in a very dark sky, you can be part of a community that studies data. So um, there is an international astronomical search collaboration that provides data and software and helps um, people become part of this team. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of data to sift through and the human brain is extremely good at um, figuring out what might be um, interesting and, and what probably is not. So I hope that you consider uh, these options. I'm always, of course, uh, uh, an advocate for looking up because I think not only do we see uh, ways of potentially protecting our planets, but also because we get to feel connected to the overall cosmos. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, attending today. I would like to thank uh, donors, members, and friends of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's Planetarium. Special thanks, of course, to the College of Letters and Science and the Leonard E. Parker Center for Gravitation, Cosmology, and Astrophysics at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for their support for all the wonderful work that my uh, undergraduate designers uh, provide for us. I'll be happy to take questions if you if you have any. Uh, we do have one question from Barb, which is, did deep impact cause any significant damage to the comet that it hit? Um, it did not. So I think the bottom line with deep impact is that the long lasting effects of the um, of deep impact were fairly modest. So we did not destroy the comet. We did not, I don't think we even changed its orbit very much. So that's, uh, it, you know, important information. We need to uh, do these experiments when the, the stakes are low um, so that we learn what works and, and what doesn't. The, I should point out though, that for the comet, our principal concern was to understand the composition of the comet because comets carry a lot of organic materials. And we're starting to suspect that life on Earth might have been seeded by organic material from comets, or indeed some of the water on our planet might have come from comets. Great question. Uh, we have a 
question and comment from James. He says, hello, Jean, great presentation. Two weeks Thank ago you. was Asteroid Day and a special occasion was dedicated to, this Asteroid Day, World Asteroid Day is a special occasion dedicated to um, the 100 times de declaration. Um, we have a question for whether or not you agree with the following statement. While we have discovered about 1 million near earth asteroids with a diameter of 70 meters, only about 1% of this population has been discovered. Do you agree with this assessment of known asteroids in our near earth environment? Anytime we talk about predicted numbers, we're in uncertain, uncertain terrain. That there are more than we've discovered is certain, but we should acknowledge that we're less likely to miss the big ones, more likely to miss smaller objects. So I think that's the thing to consider. Um, we know that there's more work to be done. Um, my understanding is that the estimate is we're at about 10% of where we would like to be. So more work is surely to be done. It would be nice if um, we encouraged our, um, our politicians to uh, work with some of that, work with the money so that we can fund such um, knowledge, we can fund these, these searches. There is an issue around the world of who's paying, and a lot of countries don't want to pay, especially for the objects that are not obviously huge, but would certainly take out large cities. So that's the issue of how to figure out who is to pay. Um, in some ways, I'm comforted that some of this uh, research might in the end be done from the Defense Department that has healthier budgets than most. Um, and that could be a real protection for our planet. Okay, I, Rusty is, go ahead. go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say that I thought that the asteroid day was the 100th anniversary of the Tunguska event in Siberia. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rusty is asking, is there any fear that either the Earth or the Moon have a change in their orbital path due to collision? Oh, there's certainly been change. I mean, we're not afraid of change by itself, right? After all, the Moon was caused by a collision with an object of probably about the size of Mars with the Earth. This is a long time ago now but that's how the moon was formed, right? It became a chunk of the earth that kind of was amalgamation of the impactor with the chunk of the mantle of the earth. Um, so presumably, yes, the earth's orbit changed as a result of that, but it's been a long time we've settled into our new ways. I don't see any other questions, but I have a personal question, which is, do you have a favorite asteroid? Do I have a favorite asteroid? Well, let's see what I like Apophis because we've been following it for a long time. We knew it was big. And we knew that it was one of the hazardous, so it comes. I know that it sounds crazy to say that something is hazardous that's a few million miles of the earth, but we wanna make sure that we have, you know, some buffer for any kind of errors or changes in orbits. Um, so I've, I've always, I thought Apophis was interesting. So that's a name that I recall. I like Ceres because it's such a large asteroid that it, it in fact is spherical. Most asteroids look like potatoes, um, but Ceres is pulled together into a nice sphere. It's also named after Dimitra, the goddess of the harvest, and I'm a foodie. And those are probably the two that uh, come to mind. Uh, Remy, who is five, would like to know where most asteroids and comets come from. 
most asteroids come between Mars and Jupiter, and most comets that are likely to be seen by us are beyond the orbit of Neptune in what we call the Kuiper Belt. Um, I should say, since you ask, that there is a whole nother group of comets that come from the Oort cloud, but they are much farther away and their periods can measure into the hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So they don't come around so, so they don't come around very often. Great I question. Re I was reading about one today that was in the Kuiper belt and then it changed and now it's in the Jupiter belt of comets. It does happen. I mean, there are asteroid, uh, excuse me, there are comets that get uh, dragged in by Jupiter. In fact, there was a, a comet called Schumacher Levy 9 in uh, uh, July of 1994 that was just like any normal comet and it was going toward the sun and, you know, doing that elliptical parabolic shape. And instead, it kind of came to move toward Jupiter and said, oh, I think I'm going to go over there and said, Foo, and, and smashed into Jupiter. And if you're old enough to remember that, that was awesome because we saw the scars in the atmosphere of Jupiter that were caused and they were visible for weeks after the event. That was in fact, one of my uh, highlights probably of my graduate career. I don't see any other questions for now. I'll put our email in the chat. In case anyone thinks of something later. Okay, that, that happens to us all. These are deep topics, you know, you might go to bed and think of something. <laughs> Um, I was interested to get some feedback from our audience. I know this is a, there's a lot of information and I threw a lot of numbers around. Um, I'm just wondering if I explain terms well enough to follow. We'll let, we'll let people marinate with that. There is one more question from James, which is if we want to discover more NEO near Earth, object asteroids, what tech would we would be the best fit? Earth-based telescopes or orbital telescopes like NEOWISE? Most asteroids are not very bright in visible light. Most of them are better in infrared. So it's much easier to see infrared light from space. So the bottom line is that um, you would probably want infrared. And I'm happy to tell you that in 2025, I can't remember what it's called now. I think it's called NEO-SM. I think it's been renamed, but it used to be called NEO-SM, um, is a bigger, better NEO-wise. So the reinforcements are coming. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions or comments. Barb thinks that it was a wonderful presentation and very easy to follow, but I know Barb is a regular. <laughs> Thank you, Barb. It would be nice <laughs> to hear. I mean, I'm very grateful for your uh, feedback. Silence is scary. Quiet means that I didn't hit the mark and it's just good to know. I really tried to break the concepts um, into hopefully understandable chunks, but um, I know I'm aware that I did try and do quite a bit today. It's hard when you're talking about lots of rocks floating through space. Right. Okay. Well, I put our email in the chat. Um, any last words, Jean, before we sign off for the night? I just want to say thank you again for joining me in this blockbuster adventure. 
Um, and I do hope that uh, we'll get to see you again when we talk about um, about shooting stars. And I'm so excited that we're already looking at uh, fall programs now and getting all jazzed up for that. Thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely evening. We did have one more question come in from Lucia, which is, is it possible to determine the composition of an asteroid from Earth and will that lead to mining in space? Oh, that's another good question. People talk about mining in space like that's some sort of easy thing. Um, it's hard. It's very hard, very expensive to talk about mining in space that would ever be competitive to what we do on Earth. The only thing you can imagine is if we can find uh, isotopes or rare elements that are you know, harder, much harder to find on Earth. Um, I don't think that there's going to be commercial mining on asteroids in the foreseeable future. Um, however, I, there is certainly more interest in it. There's more interest. And I have my advice here, be a protector of planets and asteroids and watch out, you know, just, just make sure you're paying attention to what politicians are proposing and agreeing. Um, there is talk about changing the rules in space and making it more friendly to, com to commerce. And we should just make sure that um, we are careful of other worlds. Great question. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end it. We yeah. did have uh, someone say, I am not a scientist and I follow this lecture quite well. Well, thank you very much. All right, well, I'll have you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again. And uh, I'd like to thank also Victoria Robison who without her, this couldn't be possible and, uh, and acknowledge uh, Nate Sardine, who did the design, uh, beautiful work in this program. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.